Well, it is three o'clock, so um, I'd like to call the June 21st, 2021 Water Longmont Water Board meeting to order. Heather, could you please start with the roll call? Yes. Todd Williams. Here. Uh, Allison Gould. Here. Kathy Peterson. Here. Uh, Scott Holwick is absent today. Roger Lang. Here. And... Ken Hewson? Here. Nelson Tipton? Here. Wes Lowry? Here. Kevin Bowden? Here. Francie Jaffe? Here. Uh, Jason Elkins? Here. And Heather McIntyre is here. Uh, Council Member Martin? That here. Rinse it out. We are good to go. Okay, we have a quorum for the meeting. Yes, we um, do. So the next item is approval of the April 19th, 2021 Water Board meeting minutes. Um, are there any questions, comments on the meeting minutes? And I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to where we get to gallery view, sorry. Um, I am not seeing any hands up. Um, and. I know Allison is on her way to um, a screen, <laughs> so I can't see her. But um, <clears throat> if there are no comments on the April 19, 2021 Water Board Minutes, we need a motion to accept those. Kathy is making the motion to accept. Is there a second? Roger is making the second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the minutes are approved. The next item, item four, is the water status report. Nelson? Yeah, Chairman Todd, I'll go ahead and uh, give the water status for June 21st. So the flow on the St. Brain Creek today at 10 a.m. was uh, 321 or 351 CFS uh, with the historical average for this date at 545 CFS. So St. Brain Creek uh, peaked on June 7th at a flow rate of 1,120 CFS. There is currently no active call in the St. Brain Creek, but uh, I, I, I kind of, uh, a change could probably later in this week could happen though. So, but currently no call in St. Brain Creek. Uh, call in the main stem of the South Platte River is Sterling number one canal, Bijou. Um, admin number 14154, um, priority date of 10 1 So we had a, on the main stem, there was a free river for quite several weeks. And over the weekend, it went to this senior, this is more of a senior. So at the uh, beginning of June, the uh, St. Brain Basin storage was at 86%. So I figure they'll, the water commissioner will uh, give a end of June beginning of July, and I, I predict that number to go from 86 to somewhere in the 90 percentile for some storage. But it, just, good news for Longmont is Ralph Pride Reservoir at um, Button Rock Preserve is all but full uh, between releases and the spillway. Um, we're releasing a total of 250 CFS. Union Reservoir is also full, and we're releasing approximately eight CFS. And Birch Lake is full. Lake McIntosh is full. So for the majority of ownership of Longmont's uh, Basin Reservoir, we're in, we're in pretty good shape. We had a really good wet spring, which really helped us push as much as, I, I'm sure you guys all noticed the Oligarchy Ditch was running full for several months. We were had to push as hard as we could to get that full and and uh, with some repositioning of Button Rock water into Union and pushing as hard as we could, we did get it full. So we're, Water Resources as a group was pretty pretty happy that that occurred. And that's all I have. Is there any questions? Any questions for Nelson on the report? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Thank you, Nelson. You bet. All right. Um, item five is public invited to be heard in special presentations. Um, Ken, are there, um, or I guess let me start with Heather. There's no public invited to be heard. Is that correct? We do not have any. That's correct. Are there any special presentations today? No special presentations. Okay. All right. Um, we'll move on to item six, which is event agenda revisions and submission of documents. 
I know Allison has one item she'd like to bring up, but before that, um, can are there any um, agenda revisions or submission of, submission of documents? Uh, no submission of documents. I would like to note for the record that I, general business item 8A uh, needs will be postponed until the July water board meeting, although I would like to make a few um, explanatory comments on that particular item that you that you will be reviewing in July. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, Allison, I know before the meeting you mentioned you wanted to maybe add an item to this agenda with regards to cybersecurity. Do you wanna mention what you're thinking there? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would like to add um, an item concerning cybersecurity to the agenda for discussion. Okay, do we wanna... Um, can maybe make that item 8C on the agenda? Does that work? Um, th that would be fine, yeah. I don't know that we'll, if you're, if there's planning to take action, we can do 8C, otherwise we can put it under items from board. E either spot would be fine. Maybe maybe that makes more sense. So we'll make a, a 10C, which will be that, that item. That makes sense. Okay, that sounds good. Well, thank you. Um, I guess with that, um, in my right, West, there's under seven. There's no development activity this month. You are correct. Okay, with that, we're on to eight A. So, um, Ken, do you want to give a quick overview of the Irwin Thomas water supply agreement? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what we have is. Uh, we had a proposal to bring a water supply agreement before the board. Unfortunately, we were not able to get all the parties to the agreement um, to, to get comments and, and finalize that agreement and get it ready for you. Essentially, the Irwin Thomas property is, is a par two parcels of property located um, east of the Harvest Junction. Um, as you may know, just immediately east of the Harvest Junction area is where Left Hand Creek is flowing kind of southwest to northeast, crosses Ken Pratt Boulevard, um, and then um, flows into the St. Rain Creek. And just east of that area, um, there's an undeveloped parcel of property both on the north and south side of Ken Pratt Boulevard. Property in the north side of Ken Pratt Boulevard is open, is owned by the city of Longmont and is what we refer to as the Golden Farms open space area. And the property south of Ken Pratt Boulevard is the main Paul Irwin parcel. Um, the prop, both properties are scheduled for a uh, gravel mining operation um, that really predates annexation into the city. That was, those were, were gravel mines that were permitted through Boulder County um, prior to annexation uh, of Longmont um, well over two decades ago. Uh, the prop property owned by the city of Longmont is it's owned by our open space department, but um, the, the, mine, the gravel resource is still owned by the Golden Farm uh, Company, uh, the predecessor of the Golden, Golden Sand and Gravel Company. And uh, it has always, you know, it's always been planned for my gravel mining. Um, more recently, uh, the uh, Costco uh, approached the city about the development and, and construction of a Costco um, store. Um, and, and on the very northwest corner of the whole Irwin Thomas property, um, so I'd be immediately east of Left Hand Creek and then south of Ken Pratt Boulevard. In addition, uh, the Longmont Housing Authority is in the process of purchasing eight acres uh, of the corner of that property um, for an affordable housing development. And then there's, there's about um, another 15 or so acres that the uh, Golden Farms Company is um, planning on having for future development of, of commercial and, and, uh, and possibly mixed use development. But basically, 
in essence, the very northwest corner of that property um, will be developed. As part of that overall development process, um, the gravel mining needs to occur so that it can be done and kind of hopefully it'll be done and well on its way before um, the other developments uh, are, are completed and opened up. But as part of the overall package for the Costco, um, the actual property underneath the Costco site and the affordable housing site was going to be mined. And so there's, there's kind of ongoing negotiations between aggregate industries who, who purchased the gravel resource from Golden Farms and Golden Farms about how to make aggregate industries whole and also how they'll be able to mine. So there's quite a bit of activity going on out in that area right now in terms of planning and developing um, projects and processes. So it's um, in Longmont's interest to try to keep all those projects, both the affordable housing and the Costco development moving forward. Um, one of the one of the aspects of that is to um, get a lease back of some of the historical water, especially the, the bonus ditch irrigates those properties. Um, the property on the north side of Ken Pratt Boulevard, going all the way back to the late 1990s when originally the county purchased that property and then the county sold it to the city as open space. In that original county purchase, the shares of the bonus ditch over there were contemplated to be, by agreement, to be used for the mining operation. And then the historical bonus on the south side until that property actually develops um, would naturally be leased back under historical lease back. Currently it's uh, a hay field and um, they're using it to, to grow hay, uh, but, eventually, but eventually when they mine it, as a historical lease back, we'll be able to use that until the development occurs and we'll need that water. Ultimately that water needs to be uh, transferred and used for development. We actually do have a current change case um, filed for the bonus ditch that includes all of those um, shares of water. Um, the two, sh two shares on the north side are being changed only for the augmentation plan. The 34 shares on the south side are being changed for municipal use as well. So uh, that just kind of wanted to give you a, head, a heads up on, you know, this is a fairly big, important um, water supply agreement. We um, had hoped it'd be ready, but it's not quite there yet, but we expect to bring it to the July meeting and we'll give much more information and maps and actual numbers to water board at that time. But just wanted to give you a heads up so you can kind of anticipate that coming for you at the July meeting. Uh, be happy to answer any questions. If not, we'll bring it to you in July. Okay. Are there any questions for Ken on the overview of the, um, of the agreement that will be brought in July? I'm not seeing any. Okay, um, I guess we'll revisit that in July. Thank you, Ken. Item 8B is a cash and lieu review, Wes. Yeah, so um, yeah, the board has in their packet some information on cash and lieu and I'll draw your attention to page 14 of your packet. Um, uh, what's new in, in the packet? Um, from what you've seen in your prior quarter uh, um, quarterly review um, is the cost for new water supplies. Um, and that's where I was gonna focus my attention on uh, for the most part today. Um, um, and even more so towards Windy Gap firming project. So we've updated those costs um, primarily due to uh, and driven by the um, increased requirement for the federal lawsuit. Um, so there was a payment that's gonna to need to be made for that. And so we've adjusted for that as well as um, some uh, construction cost index adjustments. And so the new Windy Gap firming project cost is shown is $18,528 an acre foot. And as you'll recall, it was currently at $17,683. So 
it, it went up almost eight hundred and fifty dollars. Um, and so we've we've shown the average cost for the uh, four different uh, items: the water conservation, windy gap, union enlargement, and button rock enlargement, and then a weighted average, which is is the um, as it relates to the firm yield. But um, just to remind the board, in the past, you've chosen to uh, look at cash and lieu as it most um, represented by Wendy Yap firming. So those are the, that's the adjusted number at $18,528. We did also include quarterly information for CBT uh, transactions. And that information is, is given the sum for the quarter uh, average acre foot cost on CBT was $76,853 per acre foot. So that's right around $58,400 per unit. And that range of, of as, as you would see in the following pages, ranged anywhere from 54,000 unit to 62,500. So there's a, a pretty good range. It seems to be stabilizing a bit, but it's still considerably higher than the uh, cost for new water supplies. Um, other than that, I really don't have a whole lot to, to share, but I'm happy to answer some questions if you have any. Thank you, Wes. Are there any questions for Wes? So I'll go ahead, Roger. You're muted, Roger. The numbers on the far right um, on the chart, I, they're off the screen now. I'm trying to, one's in parentheses, the other's bold. What, what is the difference between them? the 17,9990 versus 16,660? So the, the bolded number, the $17,999 is simply the ar arithmetic average of the four. So if you took the if we took the sum and added them up and divided by four, you come up with uh, roughly seventeen nine ninety nine. Okay. The, the bracketed one is a weighted average based upon the um, uh, uh, firm yield. So there's a uh, or the so what we've done and it's it's kind of, we have it kind of footnoted on the uh, number one. It's further down in our in our thing, but it says that the weighted average construction cost for new water supplies is based upon the respective dry yield. So we've we put more weight towards a dry yield on some than others. And so, but again, I think the emphasis is the project that we're looking at moving forward with is the Windy Gap firming and that's uh, higher than the two, which is that 18,528. Okay, all right, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, are there any other questions? So as, as Wes mentioned, I guess we're gonna be consistent with what we've done previously, which is to set the cash and lieu at the current cost per acre foot um, of Windy Gap firming. We would go from the 17,683 to 18,528. Um, I don't know if there's any discussion uh, by the board of that. Um, if not, we, <clears throat> we would need a motion um, to go ahead and adjust the, I guess, the recommendation um, to city council to go from the 17,683 to the 18,528. So it looks like Roger just made the motion. Is there a second? Kathy is seconding that motion. Um, welcome, Allison, we can see you. So <laughs> glad you <coughs> could patch in there. Um, is there, uh, any further discussion on on the change or the recommendation um, to council on the cash and lieu? I'm not seeing any. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that motion carries unanimously. All right, so now we are on to section nine. And 9A is a water monthly water supply update. Wes, are you going to handle that? Yeah, I really, Nelson did a pretty thorough job of capturing what's what we've done and what's going on. I'll just reiterate that um, Button Rock and Union are now full. Those were 
And those were two pretty large vessels that were important for Longmont to fill. Um, we use Button Rock in the winter and we use Union Reservoir um, in the summer. And so quite an accomplishment and I appreciate everyone's help to make that happen. We, um, again, as Nelson said, we peaked on the 7th. The average peak usually happens around the 10th. So right, right around what you maybe consider uh, a normal peak time. Uh, the last time we um, seen flows over a thousand CFS in the peak, that would have been back in uh, 2017. And then um, it was a few years before that, that we had it again. So it's kind of, I went back and just looked at the last 10 to 15 years and we've been over a thousand CFS probably a little, little over half that time, but it was refreshing to um, see the higher flows compared to last year where we didn't even get into the 500 CFS range. So um, again, we're expecting, well, if you were to look at the snowpack, there's really no readings for that right now, for all intents and purposes, most of that's ran out. Um, and that's thus why we're expecting a call in the same rain to occur probably later this week. The Highland will be probably the call for quite a while. Um, as you guys may recall, they're the largest ditch in the St. Rain Basin. They're taking um, over 250 CFS of the river right now. So it takes a little while for the um, Highland to drop out. But um, uh, we're just thankful that we were able to put as much into storage as we, as we did. And we think that uh, when we get the uh, state water commissioner's report for the year or for the month end, uh, we're going to expect to have nearly everything full in the basin. So other than that, I really don't have a whole lot more unless there's a couple questions. Are there any questions for Wes? Wes, I do have one. Did, were, did you guys end up having to move any water from Button Rock down into Union? I know, you know, obviously it went real wet um, for a while and maybe you had moved some prior to that. Just curious what you ended up we doing. We did. Yes, we did. Back in uh, May, um, from yeah. about May 1st to the 26th, uh, 26th um, we, we put some water in there, little, roughly around a thousand acre feet. We... Um, on the 27th of May, um, some of our decrees start coming in, but we had done, we had ran the numbers and realized that had we not done that, we weren't probably gonna have enough capacity in the oligarchy ditch to get that filled. So uh, preemptively, we, we moved some water into Button Rock as the board will recall with Button Rock being an on-channel reservoir, it's easier for us to fill that quickly than the off-channel reservoir of Union. And so, um, we essentially moved some Clover Basin Decree that was water that was eligible to be stored in both uh, Button Rock and Union. And, um, and we got that filled. And then now we're, we're storing some of that same Clover Basin water back uh, or we, until it was full up in Button Rock. So but to answer your question, yes, we moved about a thousand acre feet in there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Wes? I am not seeing any. All right, we'll move on to item 9B, which is the monthly legislative report. Ken? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, honestly, uh, the best report is the legislature's done. <laughs> so, um, there, you know, there, there really weren't a lot of real interesting water bills this year. Um, there were a couple other bills I, I thought I would highlight in addition to what um, a little bit of water bills there were. Um, just just go through a, a couple of them that um, ended up being passed. Um, the first one was uh, House Bill 1008, which was the Forest Health Project Financing. Um, that bill essentially allow, now allows uh, special forest health districts to be formed. It, it requires the owners of the property and the county um, that it's occurring in to uh, approve it before it can go. But it's, it's kind of an interesting, um, it's an effort to try to get um, forest bills, forest health projects built um, more 
uh, closely uh, to to where they're needed up the, up in the mountains. So not a lot of impact there. Um, probably the biggest water bill was House Bill 1046. Um, everybody calls it the turnback bill, um, but that was its title was the Water Share Right Municipal Ditch Corporation Bill. <laughs> Don't know who named that. Um, that was the bill that, that originally was intended to allow um, uh, turn back into the ditches, into the uh, minority, I'll call them minority shareholders in ditches, um, it, especially in the case of a change case where, say, example, for example, Longmont will change part, half of the ditch out of the ditch. Um, when Longmont's not using it, um, we could allow our shares to be used by the other shareholders in the ditch. The, the courts have not been allowing that um, more recently. And so um, there was a bill that went through uh, really to allow um, turn back and to, 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 to not put basically a limit on the remaining shareholders in, in the unchanged shares or at least minority shareholders who are still using their shares within the ditch for the historical irrigation. Um, that bill was probably one of the more hotly contested bills. And um, uh, honestly, it, uh, it, it got a little bit of a lot of pushback, primarily by uh, users downstream on the plat, main stem of the plat who wanted to see water go down there, both, both historical irrigation ditches, but also um, in my estimation, a lot of the entities that are looking at water on the lower plat um, uh, in the metro area, you know, wanted to see more water down there. So, um, so the final bill that came out essentially says that uh, shareholders can in a mutual ditch can can take you know the, the mutual ditch company can allow the water to be distributed as it sees fit that you don't have to do it pro rata based on the ownership in the ditch um, as long as it's you know through some rotation scheme that's really how all of the ditch companies have historically worked for 150 years um, so that really didn't change anything just kind of um, put that into, into statute language. Um, it, the, the parts that said, if you change a case out of the ditch, um, you can't let that water go back in the ditch. That um, was in the original bills and was struck. And so, so the bill really doesn't do much, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't hurt any either. It doesn't prohibit it. Um, it will now be up to each individual case um, which is what many argued that that, that should be, you know, um, adjudicated in every single change case. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, I, I think that's, you know, Longmont has historically had language that said if we're not using our water, um, it can be used in a ditch. Although once a year we have to declare whether we're going to use our water as a changed water or irrigation water, we can't go back and forth, but we, you know, uh, for our use, you know, um, on the historically irrigated land, but for the ditch itself, you could, but now, now you can't. So um, that, I expect that bill to come forward in the future again. I expect there to be a push for that um, particular concept as the uh, water court is really prohibiting it anymore on, on cases. Um, and that was really about the only true water bill we had <laughs> all year. So uh, we did have a related bill, which was House Bill 1052, um, water related. Um, it basically defined pump hydroelectric as a renewable energy source. Um, there have been, um, Many people over the years uh, wanting to uh, 
have hydropower defined as renewable energy because it, um, well, it is <laughs> in my mind, but um, it's never counted uh, as a renewable energy source. And um, so there was a bill, the bill 10452 came through to allow that um, because it didn't define um, how you could build that project. There was a lot of opposition and the opposition wanted to make sure um, and basically it was, it was those um, who don't support um, storage reservoirs, uh, water storage reservoirs. So, so the bill basically, while it defines it, um, it says it, as long as it's the, the reservoir that's con, you know, constructed or is part of the, high, the pumped hydroelectric um, system um, is not located on a natural waterway. So uh, that, that really kind of left that, you know, it left that long-term argument about on, on stream, on channel story. Um, but it, it does open it up if you build a completely off stream hydro pumped storage hydroelectric project, it does allow that to be uh, count um, towards um, renewable energy. So it's maybe a step in the right direction, um, trying to get us, you know, into one of the solutions for, for um, renewable energy is, is pump storage. So it at least starts that. Uh, and again, not directly a water bill, but a related water bill is was House Bill 1226. Um, it, it was uh, a bill which allowed for more robust um, aquatic nuisance species testing. Uh, you know, if, if anybody's ever driven a boat to a reservoir um, anymore, you have to have your boat inspected for aquatic nuisance species, quagga mussels, zebra mussels, um, snails, those, those um, millefoil, all kinds of plant species. Um, and this bill just um, actually allows officers who are doing those inspections to physically require a, a vehicle to stop. Many, many people didn't realize they had a check station and you didn't have to stop at the check station. <laughs> they could just drive right through and there's nothing they could do. Um, and now that's a hundred dollar fine, still not a big fine, but in my mind, I think that was a positive bill. Uh, anything you do for aquatic nuisance species control, in my mind, is, is positive for the water, water industry. And I, I always support that. Um, and then uh, House Bill 1260 was uh, just kind of continuing um, support for the state water plan and they appropriated some about $20 million for moving the, the current uh, state water plan update as well, well as um, some money for the basin round tables to implement um, the state water plan update as it moves forward. So again, just kind of preferably related. And then finally, um, again, this one is again, is fire, but it's related. It's, it was set up Bill 240, which is the Watershed Restoration Grant Program. And that actually, I do believe, is positive for us. Um, it appropriated $20 million to put out for grants to do watershed um, restoration, primarily uh, for grant funding of forest stewardship uh, to prevent wildfire, future wildfires. And we are doing some efforts um, in the St. Rain Basin to try to look at um, wildfire prevention instead of always, you know, just reacting to the wildfire afterwards. And so we believe some of that money might be uh, available locally in our basin um, for the forest collaborative that the effort that's going on right now between the U.S. Forest Service, Boulder County, City of Longmont, um, and other entities in the in the St. Rain Basin. So we think that is that is positive. So really that's all I have on the legislation. Um, and I think it's probably good news there's not a lot of water bills because <laughs> nobody was trying to uh, do anything crazy with water this year. So I think we made it through the uh, this session pretty well unscathed.
from the water standpoint. Okay, are there any questions for Ken on the legislative items? The only thing I would mention is I think that Senate Bill 240 also allows that part of that 20 million to be used um, with the current recovery efforts. Um, and the Northern District is the sponsor for the upper portion of the East Troublesome recovery. So they're able to access that as part of their matching funds or their contribution as the sponsor with NRCS. And since Longmont obviously is a owner of quite a bit of CBT water, I think that's a, a positive um, development. The issue is ultimately gonna be how much money can our NRCS come up with on the federal side um, to match the sponsors um, portion. So there's gonna be, there's still a question as to the scope of the East Troublesome recovery, but Northern is moving forward with a portion of the money they've been allocated with NRCS and having that grant money to the extent they can get some of that from the state will help to offset what would have to be used directly out of Northern's budget. So anyway, just another kind of additional item on that one. Um, any other questions or comments for Ken on, on anything? Um, Allison? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted, I was wondering if any of our planned activities were affected at all or delayed because of the failure of the gap water bill? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear that. Can, can you repeat that? I was wondering if we had any planned activities that were affected at all by the um, the the gap water bill that was kind of contemplated and then ultimately went nowhere. Um, yeah, we really, we don't, we haven't, at least on Longmont's end, we haven't postponed any projects on that. Okay, um, okay. are there other questions that, that could, <laughs> there's quite a bit of detail behind the scenes with regards to the what's defined as gap water. And, and I think the issue is there was federal regulation, which was kind of conflicting and the state was maybe gonna take jurisdiction over what they call gap waters um, in the context of wetlands and permitting. So um, anyway, that, that's kind of a, in a nutshell, what Allison's alluding to and the state decided not to at this point take over, create, um, I guess they, they still took jurisdiction, but they have not created um, uh, within the, I see, think it was CDPHE, they were going to create staffing to help administer that, which they have not done to date. So there's kind of some questions as to ultimately if they are going to take jurisdiction, how they're actually going to administer that. So anyway, there's, there's a lot behind the scenes there but <laughs> with that question. So anyway, um, any other questions? Actually, a, a follow-up question, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, that I guess where where that question came from is I was just wondering if any of the fire forest fire mitigation activities, um, as far as doing some of the cleanup, would fall within the gap water and would you know create any delays for us trying to remediate. So that's kind of where that question was coming from. But it it sounds like that's not necessarily a concern for us. Um, but the second question was if there was anything, um, I saw the um, interim committee was posted this morning for the water for the um, General Assembly. And I was just wondering if you had any word on whether or not there were any big water bills that were gonna be passed before the interim committee that would be kind of coming up early and hot in the upcoming legislative session. Yeah, the... Uh, um... I haven't heard that the interim com water committee has taken up any discussion on any bills. And of course, they can't pass any, they can only recommend it. And then it becomes the first bills essentially that get introduced in January for, for water bills um, come out of the interim committee. Uh, you know, we have heard that, that there's real strong talk about it. and. Uh, a summer session being um, called by the governor, but if they do that, it's always it, it can only they can only act on a limited number of bills that are pertinent to whatever reason the special session is called, 
and I would be really, really surprised if there's any water bills in a special session um, this summer. Um, I would, I would think if there was a special session, it would uh, revolve around COVID or economic recovery or items like that, but uh, financial items. But I, I wouldn't see any water bills, so I really don't see any water bills coming before next January. Uh, but we do, we do track, we do follow the um, interim water committee actions because. That's for, you really do need to be listening to those and giving input so that come January, the bill looks like you want it to look like, <laughs> you know, it, it's always harder to amend it in January if it's gone through the interim legislative committee first. So yeah, we'll, we'll continue to track those. Great, thank you, Ken. Any other questions? Okay, looks like we're on to item Item 9C, which is a Windy Gap firming project update, Ken? Yeah, um, quick update on Windy Gap. There's probably not a lot more since our last meeting. Um, just to refresh, the, the federal lawsuit was settled, um, signed. Um, the first uh, installment, it was a $15 million settlement, and that first installment's gone forward. And um, I'm not 100% sure if the money's actually been transferred because uh, the Grand County Foundation that's going to receive it and then disperse it, they weren't, weren't quite ready for <laughs> this big a chunk of money. And I mean, uh, you know, they're, 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 I'm sure they're, they're a great organization, but this is, this is real big time with going to have a lot of people looking at it, you know, as compared to a, more of a local entity that works within Grand County. Um, so they're still working a little bit to get that done, but with that process, it, you know, it's all been, all been signed by the courts, everything's done. And, uh, that, that funding will, will come, uh, the first 5 million now, the remainder, remaining 10 later on as the project proceeds. Um, all the participants are on board, uh, right now, the, probably the biggest push is the financing portion of it. Um, the municipal subdistrict is looking very hard at trying to get everything done and ready for the pooled financing um, bond issuance. Uh, probably the biggest new item coming out of the financing is that um, the city of Broomfield, city and county of Broomfield, um, they have, since they're a county, in addition to a city, they're a county, their process takes a little bit longer to go through financing. Um, for one thing, Longmont, um, we've already we've already gone to our voters. We've we've had the bond, the issuance of the bonds approved by the voters. So at this point, we just need council to authorize staff to actually sell the bonds. Um, so that that will be occurring in July, and then we'll be able to go out and sell the bonds. And, We'll plan on having our money up to uh, Miss Sub District early August. Unfortunately, for the uh, city and county of Broomfield, they have they have to have like thirty days between a first reading and a second reading of an ordinance to issue bonds. And then, instead of in Longmont's case, when when we do an ordinance, take we have a ten day waiting period where anybody in the public can actually petition against the the ordinance. Um, the, since our county, they have a 30 day. So they're going to have first reading in early July, second reading in early, late July, early August. And then there's a, like a 30 day waiting period. Then they go out and sell bonds. So they won't have their funding available till September. So that's going to slightly delay the payment by Broomfield. Um, but all the other participants, I think, will be ready to go and uh, moving forward. Uh, the Broomfield has signed an agreement that allows them to bring their money a few weeks later than they otherwise would uh, with the acquiescence of all the other project participants. But kind of the flip side of that to kind of make sure that we're all comfortable that Broomfield is serious about going forward, they were going to bring 22 million in cash 
Um, they've already brought 2 million last January. So they, they were told you need to bring the remainder 20 million of, of cash cash to the project um, right now. And so they have actually already done that. And those funds have been transferred up to Northern to go into an escrow account, similar to the escrow account that we set up for Longmont's money when we send it up. So there were, were, you know, right now we're comfortable with Roomfield's council um, and that everything's moving forward smoothly there, just kind of a timing issue. So that's a little bit of a timing issue. Still, still plan on once um, the, the pooled financing will sell early August, our financing will sell late July and the funds will be available early August. So the bulk of all the money, um, both pooled financing and the uh, other participants, cash financing um, will all be up there early August. So getting really close to ready to issue the notice to proceed for the contractor. I mean, that's really kind of already happening. They're, they're getting ready to um, construct our staging area and, and uh, they're, they're, you know, fully ready. So um, looks like we might actually have a, a good groundbreaking um, probably sometime in August and uh, certainly would want to invite water board members to uh, attend that um, groundbreaking if, if you're interested in going. I think it'll probably be pretty big. <laughs> a lot of people there, I hope, and uh, a lot of excitement about getting the project moving forward. So that's really where we are right now. Um, nothing on the ground yet, but we're getting really close and uh, we feel like we're moving moving forward in a positive manner. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any on that arena. Great. Are there any questions for Ken? Ken, I, I do have one question. So, you know, the when we did the cash in lieu, it looks like the costs have gone up just under 5% is the increase in the per acre foot cost. Um, I assume with the bond issue, I think you gave yourself enough room that if the cost went up, it would still fit within the bond issuance. Does it also, you know, I think the other question was, is hey, if the cost goes up, was that due to rates? And, and you know, maybe the, the amount would be the same, but there'd have to be redistribution or prioritization of work um, within the overall use of the money from the rates. I, have you been working through that as in terms of what that means? from a practical standpoint in terms of, you know, are there certain projects, did you have enough contingency in there where it covers this increase or is there having to be a shifting around of money um, to cover that increased cost? Just curious. Sure. That's, that's a great question. Um, and the short answer is yes, there um, was and will be enough money and contingency in the project. So um, of that, of that increase about one half, Half of the increase is attributable about $400 per acre foot of the 800 acre foot increase in the cash and lieu um, was attributable to the federal settlement. The federal settlement um, is actually um, going to be, so the first thing is um, that won't, only the first one third of that, for about 400,000 will be charged to us um, right away on, on, the, uh, uh, on the next annual uh, assessment. Um, and then the remain uh, one third will occur about halfway through the project a couple of years from now. And the remaining one third will occur um, at, at the end of the project when, when it gets completed um, uh, and ready for, you know, and accepted by the state engineer's office. So that spreads that um, cost that half of the cost out um, quite a bit. It actually is not going to be charged against the, the initial capital for the project. It's going to be in the uh, yearly assessments that we pay every year for Windy Gap, which is good for us because we will then be able to have future cash and loop payments, the, the actual payment you're review, reviewed today that those funds will be available um, to pay that off over time. And so there won't be 
we will we won't need to go to either the bond or to any um, rates uh, of the customers to for that cash. That'll that'll be future cash in lieu, um, which will be pretty easily cover that amount. Uh, the other half is um, project escalation costs, primarily due to the delay. Uh, um, the project had enough. Uh, contingency in it that that right now the project is not asking the the participants to come to the table with additional funding to cover those delay costs um, they're basically being picked up by the contingency but what that does is that narrows your contingency which would be a cause for concern you know in year three or four if you need those contingency funds um, and for us, we really have two avenues if, if that were to exceed the contingency that is. So, so as a result, we're not being asked at this point for that additional half of the, of the cost increase. Um, if the contingency isn't enough to, because we've eaten some up with this right now, um, A, we'll have future cash in lieu available to pay that. But also our bond issuance of the of the amount that the voters approved, which was thirty six point three million dollars, I believe we only need about thirty four to thirty five million um, for uh, to actually bring the, all the cash that we need to bring forward, um, and we're, we're a little bit lower than we than we were looking at uh, a little while ago mostly because we've had additional cash in lieu come in uh, between, e even, though the, even though the federal <laughs> lawsuit cost us money and, and unfortunately delayed it, during that delay, we had additional cash in lieu money come in. And so one of our financing strategies is we're, we're basically taking all our cash in lieu and putting it on the project as the first dollars in then we're using that high mountain dam fund as the next dollars, all of that. And then um, we, had, we had some cash in our um, cash reserves that we were gonna use. So, so in, in essence, the amount we need to bond is reduced by the amount of additional cash in lieu that we've realized over the last couple of years. And so, yeah, there is, uh, in addition to all of the, all of the above, there's a little bit of money um, in the bond. So we got a little bit of money in the bond and, and we'll have money uh, if for some reason all the contingency is eaten up, then we'd, we'd have cash in lieu and we'd have, we'd have a little more there. So there's quite a bit of, uh, not, you know, I hate to say when, when we're talking millions of dollars, <laughs> I hate to say quite a bit, but yeah, there is funding there that that'll, um, allows us more not currently at all concerned about where we are from a financial standpoint, because we, we do have that, both of those gaps, um, they're covered. Okay, so thank you, Ken. Hopefully that, that helps. Helps. Yeah, it does. All right, so now if there's no further questions on that, um, move on to 9D, which is the Water Resource Engineering Projects Update, Jason. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I just wanted to give the board a quick update on um, a couple projects. So the South St. Vrain pipeline, um, as you might recall, we've got two projects uh, kind of going simultaneously. We've got the rehab project and then we've got the pump station project. Um, we have uh, Smith and Loveless under contract to build the pump station. They've submitted their first engineering drawings and we've reviewed them and they look very good. We, we, have, we have comments, but there's no, um, no red flags, nothing that's gonna delay the project. So far, everything's going good. And if anything, we're making up for some lost time. Uh, they submitted their first round of engineering drawings two weeks early, so we were actually caught off guard. We, we weren't quite prepared for that, so they surprised us, so that was, that was a good thing. Um, so the pump station's moving forward, and then um, knock on wood, we think we have the entire section of the entire South St. Rain pipeline unclogged now. We think we have all the material out of it from, from the flood. Um, we're in the process of running a camera through to try to confirm this um, and then try to identify any point repairs we're going to need to make. Um, but so far, everything's looking very promising. We have um, a, a contract under um, a contract executed with um, 
CNL water solutions to get the liner uh, installed. So that's on order. Um, that's looking to be about uh, 12 to 16 weeks lead time, but that was expected and everything is on schedule. So um, I've been saying it for a while and I'm gonna keep saying it. I think the South St. Vrain pipeline will be back online early spring of next year with maybe even a pump station. So that's, uh, it's going pretty good. So, so far uh, it's been, it's been a busy schedule, but uh, everything's looking very promising and uh, I'll keep the board updated as things unfold. And um, hopefully uh, we're kind of over the hump on some of this stuff and it's smooth sailing from here on out. Any question? Thank you, Jason. Was there uh, any other, that's the update. Is there another project or is that approved? Um, unless the board has specific questions. Those are, those, those are the two big projects I have updates on. Some of the other okay. stuff, not a lot of change. So I okay. it was necessary. All right. Are there any questions for Jason on the South St. Brain pipeline projects? I'm not seeing any. Great. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Okay, we're on to um, agenda 10 um, items from the board. First off is review of major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Are there any, any board members have anything they want to bring up on this item? Okay, I'm not seeing any um, on 10B. Um, we'll have uh, the, the item or the discussion item is future in-person monthly meetings discussion. Ken, are you going to take that? Yes, be happy to, to start out there. Um, so as, as Water Board may recall, um, when um, we all went home <laughs> and the pa pandemic really took off, um, one of the things we started doing um, was having our water board meetings online. Um, and we are allowed to do that during emergency, per, uh, when emergency declarations occur. Um, and as, as a result, we've, we've been off, you know, on remote ever since. Um, the city council has, um, is now ready to go back into um, in-person meetings. Um, they'll actually be starting their first um, in-person meeting, I believe, um, June 29th, um, at the end of this month. I think everybody's excited for that. <laughs> um, as a result, um, we will, you know, I don't know, I don't know that there's going to be a declaration, but essentially, you know, the, the emergency is over um, in, in that um, from, from a legal standpoint of how you can and can't have meetings. That pretty much kind of sets us into a situation where um, it would, you know, I, I think if the board is st still not quite comfortable yet in having in-person meetings, we could probably go for a little bit longer on remote, but but we're getting you know close to the end of the, um, of the emergency. So um, I did want to, uh, Pose to the board that we may want to look at an in-person meeting, uh, go back to in-person meetings in July to be consistent with what city council um, is now going to be doing. But I wanted to open up for the board to get your feelings um, and discussion on that. Okay, thank you, Ken. Any questions, comments? from the water board on going back to in-person meetings. I guess I'll give, Roger, go ahead. You're muted again, Roger. Sorry about that. If you had some comments, you could go ahead, Todd, but you know, my general opinion is if everybody's headed in that direction, I I don't know that I see any reason from my standpoint why we wouldn't want to head there next month's meeting unless there's something that I don't understand that it would be delaying us from doing that. But I'd, I'd be comfortable doing that. I'm just offering my opinion. Okay. And Roger, I'm, I'm of the same mind. I think um, my experience is I think I'd, I'd much rather um, have in-person meetings. I think you gain a lot more from those than I, I like the zoom meetings. I think they've worked well in the, given the situation, but 
to the extent we can come back in person, I would much prefer that. Um, so that that's kind of where I'm at. Plus, it gives me an opportunity to meet Allison in person and some of the board members we've added since <laughs> that have been only virtual to date. So anyway, that, that's where I'm at. I don't know, Allison, if you have any thoughts or Kathy, if you have any thoughts. I would uh, second both uh, uh, Roger and um, Chairman Williams, your thoughts and look forward to meeting you all in person. Okay. I also, okay. I also think it's, you'd lose a lot. I mean, I think we've done the best we can, thanks to staff actually doing the Zoom meetings, but you're really, uh, I think you lose a lot of the nuance <laughs> when, when it's all, it gets really dry when it's all virtual. And as the father of three teenage boys and have to do that <laughs> school for however long, I'll second that comment, Kathy. It's tough to, to kind of stay engaged as much as when you're there in person. So thank you for that comment. Um, all right. Do you have what you need on that then, Ken? I think, um, do we need a motion or anything along those lines to go back? Or do we just go ahead and um, set it for next month in person? Um, well, I, I do have one clarifying question I would like to ask, and that is um, staff is comfortable having the meeting where we normally have it at the service center, but um, that's a little bit smaller room. Um, we're usually not overrun with uh, public <laughs> invited to be heard at the meeting, but uh you know, if a lot of public comment might get a, a little tight there. Um, staff is very comfortable. It's, it makes it a lot easier if we can have it there. But um, we could also, if the water board's not, you know, is comfortable having an uh, in-person meeting, but not comfortable having it here, we could look for other locations. Um, but um, we're fine in doing that. And yeah, if all I need is a consensus from the board, if you um are so inclined we'll we'll start those meetings next month i guess my perspective is we've I, I think we've only had one or two public invited to be heard um and not more than probably one a meeting since i've been on the water board so i'm fine having it at the service center as it always has been um does everybody anybody have an issue with that suggestion that just keeps it simple as well for staff which i appreciate Okay. okay, let's go well, that direction then. Ken. Thank you. Um, so move on to item, we added an, an item 10C, which is cybersecurity. Um, Allison, do you want to um, go ahead and get... Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, as all of you probably have, I'm sure you've heard quite a bit on the news about the Colonial Pipeline hack. Um, and as part of that coverage, one thing that I, I continuously heard is that there's local governments are potentially going to be targeted as a part of um, those type of compromising uh, cyber operations. So I thought it might be timely to bring that up to the water board and um, just ask some really basic questions uh, uh, to our, um, the folks who would be overseeing that specifically um, what type of cyber security do we use? Um, and what is our plan if we do have any sort of system compromise? And um, those are things that I'm sure we don't necessarily wanna talk about in a very publicized setting uh, for security purposes. So I wanted to bring up um, with the board, if that is something maybe we could hear a little bit more about, but in maybe a more um, secure setting. So perhaps in some sort of like executive session, um, if we do have that coming up um, at our next in-person um, meeting. That's all I have. And do you wanna, um, is that something we could put on the agenda and then go ahead and set for an executive session topic? I mean, we can, I guess I'd be talking to the attorneys on how much can we say in open session and then um, maybe, you know, obviously go into executive session for items as Allison references that are sensitive in nature or the attorneys feel like are compromising or um, can be covered under the executive session rules. Yes, um, that, that, that whole arena is a really good 
question, a really good subject because that absolutely is very high priority, very, you know, top of top of some of the things we're looking at. Um, that being said, you know, we, we do have a pretty good cybersecurity here, but uh, as is obvious, it, it can hit anybody, you know, anywhere. Um, the short answer for Longmont, at least the water, is that um, we are a little bit lucky um, in that we basically run a, a gravity system um, and that gravity system can actually operate um, completely independently of uh, SCADA control. It's certainly harder and it certainly takes more effort, but um, uh, parts of our system are, are, are manually operated. So um, we can do that. But there, there, there is a lot of things um, that we'd be more than happy to, to update Waterboard on. Um, the nice thing about um, uh, water system security is it we're actually protected at the federal level, um, kind of even a step above the state on, on um, uh, non-disclosure laws at the federal level. So we're able to not disclose a, a lot of things. In fact, we're actually required not to disclose a lot of things about how a water system operates from the federal level, um, you know, based upon the Clean uh, Drinking Water Acts. And so, yeah, that that would be, if we do it, um, then what I would do is set up uh, with our city attorney's office an executive session for the July or August. I'll have to check with them first, but prob probably one of those two meetings I'll set up an executive session and we can um, give you, um, I, I can tell you, I, I don't even get a copy of the documents. <laughs> so we do, we literally hold, hold a lot of that security stuff in a few people's hands um, and very tightly controlled and, uh, and as it should be, as, as you would want it to, as I think all the citizens would want it to be. Um, but yeah, um, that is a great subject to, to look at and, and because I do, you know, it is a good thing that water board would be concerned about. So um, if the board has a general consensus that they are very interested in um, looking into that a little bit and understanding that a little bit, be happy to do that um, either July or August as soon as we can get it set up. Okay. So Ken, you'll look into it in terms of um, getting, you know, how we get that information to the board and then we can put it on the appropriate agenda so we can yeah. get information on that. That's a, Allison, thank you for bringing yeah. that up. That's a good point. All right. Um, so we're on to item 11 and I guess where I'm going to, I do want to bring up one item there. And uh, unfortunately this is kind of with mixed feelings, but uh, I, I believe this may be Kathy's last um, water board meeting. If I'm understanding that right, I think um, and, and Kathy, I may let you speak to this a little bit, but I know you have other things um, that you're spending your time on and, and wanted to maybe allocate a little more time to those items. So I guess I'm, I'm got mixed feelings, definitely sad to see you go. You've been a great member of the water board and have added so much um, over your tenure. Uh, but I understand that, you know, you have many things that you're wanting to, you know, volunteer efforts that you want to put your time towards. So. Um, I'm glad you're staying involved in those things. I know you've you've done a great job and you'll do a great job in, in that other role as well. So I don't know if you want to say anything, Kathy. Um, I really enjoyed it, actually. And I think it was, uh, I realized I was spending quite a bit of my volunteer efforts on water, <laughs> which is what I spent my career doing. And I thought, it would probably be a good opportunity for me to uh, uh, do some of my other interests and spread my volunteer efforts. Uh, specifically, I have in the past and I would like to get back into hospice as a um, volunteer effort, not necessarily on the board end, but more on a one-on-one -on -one volunteer 
effort there. So, and then of course I've got nine grandkids that I haven't seen <laughs> during COVID and wanted to spend some time traveling, although that still seems problematic <laughs> as far as flying. But anyway, so I think it's a good uh, opportunity to let some other citizen who maybe hasn't been knee deep in water for so long and could learn, you know, how important it is to the city. I'm very impressed with Longmont's water system and always have been, but getting to know staff even more so. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you, Kathy. Sorry, I was toggling on and off my mute switch there. So, um, <laughs> well, I just, I've really enjoyed working with you. And obviously before when you were at left hand, I did as well, but it's been a joy being on you with the, being on the water board with you. So thank you for your service. The, the one other thing I guess I'll ask the board is if we get together in person, I'd, I'd like to suggest that we could maybe do a short kind of reception afterwards for, for Kathy, if you'd be willing to maybe come back in for one more month um, as a thank you. And frankly, we have, you know, Renee that left the water board and John Caldwell as well. So if we could, if, if, if we're willing to maybe afterwards, just say thank you to those who have given their time and efforts um, to the water board in the past. So if possible, I, I'm going to try to pull you in one more month here, um, Kathy, sure. if that's possible. So. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I guess that, and, and I think that's all I had, unless anybody else had um, any. And I'm sorry, my screen is kind of freezing up on us, guys. So if anybody has, has an item, if they could just let me know. Um, I'm going to move on to item 12, and that's items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. And 12A will um, revisit the cash and lieu in June. Um, and then under 12B is discuss future water boards agenda, agendas. I think the only thing with Kathy's um, departure is we're gonna need to, to nominate a new vice chair for the water board. So we'll need to put that on a upcoming meeting um, agenda. So can, can we do that or Heather? Yeah, we'll get that scheduled. Thank you. I think that um, city council okay. is doing their board interviews or did them last Friday or something. So we should have a new board member for July as well, so. Okay, great, great. Yeah, actually we, um, we interviewed them last Tuesday. We have not voted on them yet. So I assume that's gonna be on the upcoming council agenda for next Tuesday, which will be our first in-person meeting. Okay. Yeah, I think I did see that on the um, pre-agenda as, as we're working through things, so. All right, well, that sounds good. Um, is there any other um, future items that um, need to be, any future water board agenda items that anyone wants to bring up for discussion? And I'm not seeing any, so, okay. Based on that, we are ready to, oh, sorry, Ken, you have something? <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah, Todd. Um, there was one item uh, for future board meeting <laughs> that I would like to throw out to see if uh, Water Board is interested. Um, as we're getting closer to the Windy Gap um, groundbreaking and the, and the start of construction, um, the municipal subdistrict does hold tours for boards and councils uh, of the entities that are participants, special, you know, special tours um, just for the participants. And so I wanted to check in and now that we're getting that close uh, to see if water board would be interested in having a tour set up, um, could, could do it a couple of different ways, could do it maybe before uh, like, noon to three or four before one of the board meetings, could do it on a separate day, could do it on an evening, um, but um, just wanted to see if there was an interest on the board to have a special tour up there. Um, and if you do have a tour, we'd probably even invite council to come along with us and see if uh, anybody on council would like to go. Um, 
but we thought it might be an opportunity rather than go up to a groundbreaking that has 300 people and, <laughs> you know, you kind of stuck in one spot. We thought it'd be a lot easier um, to have one. So n n no need to do it, but just wanted to throw that out to see if the water board would be interested in setting up a tour. Okay. I get a thumbs up from Allison. Um, Roger, your thoughts. Okay, we got a thumbs up there. Um, I guess my preference that we could do it would maybe even make it the same day as the board meeting. Um, so then we could just do it and then roll right into our board meeting if that's a possibility for everyone else. But And we need to make sure we got a spot for Kathy to come back and participate as well. So She'll at least do that, to sure. Bring her back in, it'd be great. So Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd suggest go ahead and maybe get some dates um, for the upcoming water board meeting. See if you can run those by um, Northern staff and there's some, something that works there. Maybe then we could get it to the city council to see if who would want to participate on that end as well. So, but it's a huge allocation of obviously of money and meeting the future water supplies for the city. So I think that's a great idea, Ken. Thank you for thinking of that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Great. All right, with that, um, anything else for the good of the order here? I am not seeing any, so I'm gonna go ahead and adjourn the meeting. And once again, thank you, Kathy, for yes, all your Kathy. time and efforts with the water board. It's yes, been Kathy, wonderful, thank so you. we've appreciated it.